Hi everyone, welcome back to Brand 2020. In today's issue, I'd like to revert back to an issue that we discussed two weeks ago, corporate communications in Japan. My guest today, once again, is David Russell. David, thank you again. Thank you for having me. We talked about Dentsu about two weeks ago, and that is an issue of such major importance when you're talking about corporate communications, advertising, TV time in this country. I thought maybe we would dedicate a whole issue to it, or maybe even two. Let's get into the issue of Dentsu, where it came from, how it became this bemoth, and how does it control actually the advertising and the, the corporate communications industry here in Japan? Well, as you said, Tim, that's just a huge topic. Um, in fact, trying to understand Dentsu means trying to understand how Japan works. I think you could make a very good case that you should treat Dentsu as part of Tokyo on Fire. It's, or it's actually part of Japan Politics 101 because it's an integral part of how the Japanese government works as well. It's that big and it's that important. Right. It is so large, I mean, it eclipses even number two, which is Hakuhoto, doesn't it? Yes. It, it, just in terms of ad agencies, yes, in terms of revenues, things like that, uh, Dentsu is at least twice as big as the number two. In fact, in typical Japanese fashion, uh, Dentsu is number one, and it's much, much bigger than number two, and number two is much bigger than number three, and below that, from number four down to number 7,000, really doesn't matter. Is it an oligarchy or is it a monopoly? It's a monopoly. Okay. So is this dominance just here in Japan, or is it actually uh, represented elsewhere in other markets well, as, as well? Dentsu is very well represented around the world, not only by its own organization, which had spread globally for quite a while, but in... 2012, I think the deal was finished in 2013, uh, Dentsu acquired the Aegis Group in the UK. Now, Aegis was a very large, uh, actually multi-brand company. Uh, it was uh, big enough to be listed on the FTSE 100 index. It was a pretty big company. Uh, Dentsu acquired that in a very large deal, paid a lot of money for it, and it's paid off very well. So through the organization, which is now the Dentsu Aegis Network, D-A-N, a DAN is operating around the world and it's bringing uh, basically Aegis's world-class services to Dentsu clients outside of Japan. But that's a very, very different business than what Dentsu does here in Japan. Right. Isn't this part of their model though that they, they form joint ventures and they kind of develop the market here in Japan using the external uh, skills that perhaps the Japanese are lacking and then they, they propel themselves in uh, different areas? Well, Dentsu has had a number of joint ventures. Uh, the Aegis one was probably the last in a long series. You know, there was Dentsu, Young, and Rubicam. You probably remember that. And a bunch of others. None of them were very successful. Some of them are really spectacularly successful, but most of them really just kind of flopped, don't they? Yeah, most of them didn't work very well. But the Aegis connection has worked very well. And if you look at Dentsu's profits now, you see that most of their profit growth is coming from the DAN network, not from Dentsu internally here in Japan. Mm -hmm. They're holding even with their Japanese business, but it's been under a lot of pressure. They're very well funded because they have a, a tremendous war chest. They charge premium, and everybody that wants them, they pay out the nose to get the Dentsu brand, don't they? Absolutely. Dentsu has always had high fees, but then Dentsu provides very good services. Dentsu is probably the only ad agency in the world. In fact, it's, it's almost a misnomer to call them an ad agency. They're the only agency in the world that could really call itself a full service agency. And by that, I mean Dentsu is so much more than an advertising company that people can't even comprehend it. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say to, to foreign visitors here, Dentsu is very much like an insurance company, the kind of insurance right. company that Tony Soprano would understand. Right. Right. You want protection, you pay. Mm -hmm. If you pay well, you pay properly, you stay a good client of Dentsu's, you do get protection. You get a protection from media scandal that you can't get anywhere else in the world. Well, outside of a small banana republic, maybe. Mm -hmm. And don't come to us when the issue is, is barking at the door. Exactly. Retain exactly. us now and, um, you know, yeah. sleep well. Exactly, exactly. Dentsu clients are very well taken care of. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, that means something very different from outside Japan. Outside Japan, they get first-rate advertising services. And DAN Network is already, I think they just landed the Microsoft Global Account. That's a huge account. And the, uh, uh, what was the... Uh, Anheuser-Busch account. I mean, these are huge. These are billion-dollar accounts for regular advertising. Very different from what's going on in Japan, where they're not getting new ad accounts, but their old clients will never desert them. Mm -hmm. Their old clients may give some of their business to a rival, but they won't leave Dentsu. And for the reasons I just said, they like the protection that Dentsu offers. Well, also, you have a, a, a kind of a, a priority 
by being a long-term client. Isn't mm -hmm. that true? I mean, Absolutely. If, you're, if you've been there for 10 years, then you're okay. You're not as good as the Japanese clients who have been there you know, for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Yes, well, I think it's true that a foreign company could, in theory, get the same kind of protection that a big Japanese company does. It would just have to pay a lot of money over a long period of time, exactly right. as you say. Dentsu occupies 48 floors of the 11th tallest building in Japan. That is saying something. That is saying, you know, the, I mean, the 11th tallest building in, in Tokyo is probably maybe the yeah. 11th tallest the building is, in Asia. Dentsu occupies a thousand times more space than that because what we really mean when we say Dentsu is all of the subcontractors, all of the related companies that are connected in the Dentsu empire, mm -hmm. and it is huge. And if you talk to any creative, and in that business that's a noun, not an adjective, if you talk to any creative in Tokyo <laughs> who has done work in, in web design or in, uh, in graphic design, anything like that, anyone who has been involved in advertising and any kind of corporate communications, they have at one time or another subcontracted for Dentsu. Mm -hmm. Everyone has experiences. Everyone has some comments about those experiences. Everyone's had some kind of a run-in with Dentsu that they're willing to talk about later. Well, let's not get into, into the gossip mill. But basically, Dentsu is this enormous multi-tentacled beast mm -hmm. that has a hand in everything. Right. One of the things we talked about two weeks ago was the ability of them to attract the top students from Japanese universities. Usually, the, the cream of the crop goes to the finance ministry or one of the, the bureaucracies. But in, in the open public, Dentsu captures the rest of the, the, the top. Uh, Dentsu does very well. Dentsu certainly attracts some really top people, and they always have. In fact, just a few years ago, there was a, a famous, famous incident made in newspapers, I think, around the world, uh, what's called Karoshi. A, uh, a Dentsu employee literally died from overwork. Mm -hmm. And that woman, she's a 24-year-old Japanese woman, she was a graduate of Tokyo University. That's the cream of the crop. It doesn't right. get any better. Mm -hmm. And you know, to foreigners, we'd say, why is someone from Todai working for Dentsu? Exactly as you say, Dentsu has a very good reputation among young people. Now, the other interesting thing about Dentsu's hiring policy is that they actively recruit, not just from the top universities, they actively recruit the sons and daughters of big network broadcasters, radio networks, and big corporations. In other words, the people who will be their clients and the people who will be handling their advertising in the future. Someone has referred to this as the hostage-taking right. approach to, to advertising. That's clever, but it does have a little bit of a distasteful uh, overtone to it. Perhaps. Yeah. There, there are some people who don't have a very charitable view of Dentsu's operations. Right. Let's talk a little bit about how it got where it is right now. And I know that's a deep subject, but since they are kind of the dominant uh, corporate entity when you're talking about any, any industry in Japan, I mean, you've got automobiles, you've got computers, you've got high tech, you've got uh, transportation, but you have Dentsu. It's right up there with the big boys. How did it all get started? Gosh, that really is a huge story, and being a fan of Japanese history, I would love to delve into it for about an hour or two, but I think I'll spare you today. To abbreviate it as much as possible, the new building that you just referred, that's the new Dentsu building. It's probably about 15 years old now, but before that, the old Dentsu headquarters building in Skiji was famous. It was called, in the old days, the Daini Montetsu building, the number two Montetsu building. Montetsu, wait a minute, isn't that the old Southern Manchurian Railroad? What does that have to do with advertising? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out it has a lot to do with advertising because Dentsu had roots going way back, well, of course, before the war. The company was actually set up at the beginning of the 20th century, but it grew quite well as both an advertising agency and a news agency. And the two of them had merged at one point early in the, in the century, and then they were torn apart again. The president of the Japanese Newspaper Association, the Dengo, wanted to acquire Dentsu as part of this new government-sponsored news organization that was growing during the early war years. And the president of Dentsu did not want to give up his advertising company. The advertising revenue was very, very important. Mm -hmm. So although he'd started the business as a news agency, he gave up the news agency to the government and he held on to the advertising. Well, the news agency then became part of Dome, the most famous propaganda machine in Japan and obviously overseas in Japan's colonies. Telecommunications before the tele was in it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, Dome was huge and Dome was, you know, again, was this giant propaganda ministry and uh, that much of, of 
the early Dentsu staff wound up working for Domei. The advertising side stayed in Japan, mostly. The advertising business here grew very nicely during the war because uh, Dentsu was very well connected internally, then as now, and one of the government administrators who was responsible for consolidating different parts of industry was very, very close to Dentsu. And what happened? We had 186 advertising companies in Japan, and the next day we had 12. Administrative guidance. Administrative guidance done through a very good friend of Dentsu. And so these kinds of things helped to push the ad agency from being just another player to being the predominant player. And after the war, the fellow who had helped them wound up becoming president of Dentsu. And what's the first thing he did after the war? He took all of the guys that he knew, and even a lot he didn't know who were referred to him, people who had run the Southern Manchurian Railway, uh, a scandal-ridden uh, organization from some of the darkest chapters of Japan's wartime history, took these guys and put them into Dentsu, and many as managers and some as directors. Mm -hmm. Somebody from the thought police was made a director of Dentsu. Okay. And so a lot of people today who have run-ins with Dentsu say, you know, it's just their old DNA coming to the fore. Well, you can somewhat see that because the somewhat militaristic way that they run uh, the operations, the way they bring people in. They climb all people who join Dentsu, climb Mount Fuji. That's right. On one outing. That's and right. And can you imagine how many people that is? They can't fit all of these people into a single room. Yeah. Uh, it's a tradition that goes back to 1925. All, all new managers and all new employees have to climb Mount Fuji, and then at the summit, they pray for the success and future prosperity of the firm and their clients, I right. think in that order. Okay, <laughs> that's huge. But you know, the thing that is so funny to me about Dentsu is they didn't go public until just you know 17 or 18 years ago. That's right, that's right. It, it was privately held for a long time. They didn't want to go public and they didn't need the money. That's, that's right, they didn't need the money, but then now they're on the, the public stock exchange, you can buy shares of them and they throw a lot of weight. <laughs> They've always thrown a lot of weight. Uh, Dentsu has an enormous amount of clout in this market, absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And we should do an episode just on that of how Dentsu actually does control the media and to what extent they control the media. And is their control waxing or waning? There are a lot of different opinions there, but it is fascinating. I truly believe you cannot understand contemporary Japan without understanding the role that Dentsu plays in managing the message for the government, for corporations, inside Japan, and to some extent, externally as well. You know, in addition to the study of Dentsu, we should also do a series on the Manchurian uh, Railroad because that's a, that's a huge component of even now contemporary Japan uh, industry and, and trade. Absolutely. Everything that we think of as Japan Incorporated was created in Manchuria in the 1930s. The, it was the, a test ground. It was. It was a laboratory for creating what they saw as an ideal state, what we would see as a kind of extreme fascism, but it was an ideal state created in Manchuria, and the managers of that state came back, became cabinet ministers during the war, and went on to become prime ministers after the war. Mm -hmm. And the man who was most responsible for all of that was the famous Nobusuke Kishi. Kishi was the man who actually created this system in Manchuria, and then came back and recreated it in Japan, and became prime minister twice. And if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Kishi had a son-in-law named Abe Shintaro. I believe he wound up becoming foreign minister. Didn't That's he? right. And didn't he have another son? I'm trying to remember his name. Yes. Yeah, oh, another Abe. And if I'm not mistaken, he too became prime minister twice. Right. So it's a, it's a long family line. And it's very interesting that the current prime minister, Mr. Abe's grandfather, Kishi-san, was violently opposed to Article 9 of the Constitution. He wanted to revise Article 9 of the Constitution way back when. Mm -hmm. And here we see it in the 21st century, the same old stories coming back to life. Well, I think the Prime Minister is kind of touched by that wand, wouldn't you say? I mean, this is what his grandfather wanted him to do, his great-grandfather too. So we want to be back in that, that zone. Well, and, I think, there, I think the DNA from, is there. Yeah. I think the DNA is there very much in politics, but I think relevant to our discussion today, the real DNA here is the old-time bureaucratic and military DNA from the pre-war years and the early war years that's coming out in Dentsu's operation. Dentsu, the giant in Japanese politics, entertainment, and industry. It's a huge issue. We'd love to delve into it a little bit more. We just don't have the time today. Perhaps in a later issue, please stay tuned.